Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to episode eight of the Shack series. So we've got uh, James Hickman coming on, who should be coming on any minute. Uh, hope you've all had a great weekend and ready for another tough week in the office. Uh, if you're either diving or swimming. Hello, Clark Ski One. And James has hopped on. Him. Might be a minute. Hey, hey James. James, how are you? Yeah, good, man. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, what have you been up to this weekend? Oh, you know, family stuff, really. Um, I got, got two kids, so we were taekwondo, gymnastics. This morning I went for a swim, uh, ocean swim, with a couple of mates. And mm. then we had some other... Like sort of family, friends, kids round and trash. <laughs> oh, how about you? What have you been up to? Sorry. How about you? What have you been up to? Uh, I I was out camping uh, all weekend, so I went up up the coast with a few mates, and yeah, we just we just had a bit of a camping trip, ready for another tough week uh, in the pool this week. So yeah. How far did you go this week? How far in, in kilometres? Yeah. Um, geez, not too far. We're only just getting back in the swing of things. Uh, so I think we're averaging about a uh, 6K session. So not not too bad. 60K? Yeah. 10 sessions? No, we're, we did um, eight this week. All right. Yeah. So, 48K. yeah. Nothing. Nice Man. Nothing too tough. Sorry? 48 k's of breeze. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Well, I've just come back from a broken leg, so uh, i just got to ease into it. <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> well, thanks Thanks so much for coming on, uh, James. And, um, yeah, we've just got a few questions here for you, um, just from your, your swimming career, um, your working career, and um, also your um, – your radio and TV production company that you've that you've also got as well. Um, so we'll kick off. Uh, when did you start swimming? Yeah, well, so it was early days. Uh, like as a young, I don't know. I mean, I can't remember not being swimming. You know, like a lot of people, I suppose. But um, like that was all learned to swim. Like, and then I started into a club uh, type environment when I was like uh, eight about eight years old uh was sort of like getting into the club stuff i was doing swimming and gymnastics together because i had so much energy when i was a kid my parents mm -hmm. were like get him into sport so yeah, yeah i got into yeah. swimming and gymnastics and had to decide uh about you know a couple of years in uh because they were like progressing to like four nights a week for each and then it's like do you want to do Swimming or do you want to do gymnastics? And I enjoyed swimming more, which is why I chose. Mm. And I think that's the right choice, at, like, to go for what you enjoy, especially if you're trying to do sport, because, you know, there's tough times. And if you're not doing something you enjoy doing, like, when the tough times come, you know, you still need to enjoy it. And so, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, it was like, um, like eight, eight till ten, I was doing some gymnastics about, 10 that's when i decided just to do the swim thing yeah yeah well a lot of young kids actually do a lot of um different sports and i for one yeah was very heavily involved with rugby league and then it just got to an age where you know swimming is so so demanding and you're you're doing you know at 16 you can be doing between seven or ten sessions a week and it's just like you know if you want to if you want to make it you got to really tuck in and, and really, yeah, get, get going on all those sessions. So there's no, there's no sessions off. Otherwise, you know, you're just not going to make it in a sport like swimming. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so uh, did you always enjoy swimming? Um, even at a competitive level, you know, those hard training blocks, it's quite natural to also feel unmotivated. Um, so in, during your entire swimming career, did you, were you always enjoying it? You know, like, 
I'm going to say uh, the, the feeling like you get after a swim session, even when, even when life isn't going in the, in, a, in the right place all the time, is, is usually good for me anyway. Mm. So even when I was like having bad sort of meets, um, the training, I still kind of, you know, you got, got the endorphins. It's where my friends were anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, I think generally uh, it was it, it 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 still is, you know, like that piece for me that is so important to just keep swimming. Uh, and yeah, I enjoy it. I mean, literally, it was that. I I always I've talked about this quite a few times, as you might imagine. And I I go back to I chose to do something I enjoy doing, and that's really important. Cause, yeah. You, you know, like I I still enjoy swimming now and i'm not really going for anything crazy but uh just just like like being in the water and mm. yeah there's just times when it's for me it's very meditative uh like you, when you get to a point where you can swim and it's no effort and you just your mind can wander you know i can just lapse and lapse and lapse and lapse people people ask you those questions when you're a swimmer like how far can you swim you're like well i could just swim for we're all day, you know, like, yeah, keep going. it's not, there's not like an end point for me, to be honest. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so swimmers are known for their quite big appetites. Um, so first food question is, what was your go to snack before training? Um, I reckon my go to snack was uh, generally like bowls of cereal. Like, uh, that was my yep. go to like, now get a bowl of cereal in and get in the car and get to training and yeah, I mean the bowl of cereal is pretty much the 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 go to piece uh for me, I reckon. What type of cereal were you into? Well, uh, I don't know if they had it here. I mean I you did have Frosties. Was Frosties yeah. uh Kellogg's Frosties? Oh man, I yeah. they're so sugary, <laughs> they're so bad, but Flipping, I love them. I, I used to go through boxes and boxes of them bad boys, but um, but yeah, I mean, I was pretty. I I, I could eat different stuff, but I think Frosties yeah. is top of them. Yeah, yeah, I oh, love Frosties. Know, I, yeah, I like they're great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mom had to stop me from eating them, otherwise I wouldn't have any teeth left. So yeah, same, same. <laughs> I haven't got much teeth left. <laughs> Uh, so favorite food after a tough session. So you've you've yeah. done one of your grueling fly sessions, and you get home. What is your favorite food to tuck into? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I think pizza is quite high on the list. Um, I mean, like back in the day, it was anyway. I was just like a carb monster then. Like, I, like one of my favorite dishes that was probably like. I ate a lot, like, would be a salmon pasta, like, pasta, mm. creamy salmon pasta with peas, and just, uh, that, that was something that I really quite liked a bit, but there's nothing like after, if you've done a mama session, smashing in quite a bit of pizza carb and re yeah. regenerating that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely, I'm the exact same. Pizza always gets me. <laughs> Fills me up, man, so well, I did. It does now even more, but that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> um, so next question, hardest swim session that you've ever done. So we had uh, Lachlan Staples, who, who was another great Australian uh, 200 butterfly. And yeah. um, he what mentioned he that he'd done. That yeah. So, oh, hardest swim session that you've ever done. Um, yeah. Lachlan Staples, he, he mentioned uh, doing 3K fly sessions that he quite enjoyed? Are you as crazy as him and enjoyed those long, long fly sessions? Or what was the hardest one that you've ever done? And, and secondly, yeah, what was your favorite, favorite one that you've ever done? Okay, yeah, good, good question. So tough air fly sessions. I had a pretty crazy coach that I had to use. We did like about a 3K fly set on a, um, a Monday morning, a Tuesday night, a Thursday morning, and a Friday night. So I was always swimming that against the girl middle distance freestylers. So you'd be doing something like 12 300s uh, or, or 15 200s 
like that was four times a week. So I was no getting away yeah. from doing distance fly. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of got to a point where, and, you know, we, so I also talked about it with my coach, which was if you can get to a point of trying to swim fly like you swim freestyle, which is, you know, get into the rhythm and just nail it out, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, so, yeah, those sort of sessions were all right. I mean, big sessions, we used to do some, 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 some crazy stuff. We'd have hell week. And big sessions would be like, I can remember doing uh, two 4,000 medleys was a hell week regular. So that's 1,000 fly, 1,000 back, 1,000 breast, 1,000 free, twice. That's eight K sessions done. Um, what else? I mean, you always did like the 100 hundreds, but we never did the 100 hundreds. We'd always do like yeah. uh, not 101 because everybody does 100 hundreds. <laughs> And quite a few people think about doing 100 and 100s to beat everyone. We always did 100 and 300s. And yeah. I did them a few times free fly. So it'd be free up, fly back, uh, like off like 80 long course doing 100 and 300s. I remember a big session that I did with, I used to train with uh, Graham Smith, who was a mile swimmer. He got bronze in, a, in Atlanta. Um, and he was always, I mean, I never felt sorry for myself because he was always in the pool after me anyway, like mm. slugging out more meters, even though I was doing pretty big sessions. But we did a, a session, which was 11.3, 11.3. Uh, that was my biggest ever one session that I swam his session. Um, and then I remember in the swim down, why you've got to do a swim down at the end of that, I don't know. But I remember in the swim yeah. down, kind of breaststroke. And uh, and I couldn't my my I couldn't turn my legs. I've done so much freestyle. I couldn't turn my legs out properly. Like it was like, oh man, no wonder he can't do any breaststroke. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, there's not many distance swimmers that can. Yeah, ten eight hundred fly. I did one time. That was pretty. Ah, um, but yeah, and uh, quite a few four hundred fly. I remember doing a lot of four hundred fly. And then, yeah. they're like the well, distance ones, but I can tell you the ones that hurt the most were more like the lactate ones where I'd end up having to do, uh, you do like a 75 max and then take 15 seconds and then have to do the um, set the last 25, if I was doing it, I'd do a short cut session like this, so 75 max, 15 seconds, last 25 underwater, just to max that last turn. And... Yeah. I'd do eight of those, but oh, I was like feeling so lactic sick at the end of eight of those. It was pretty mad. It's funny because, yeah, Lachlan said the exact same thing. He said uh, the three K sessions are fun, but yeah, anything to spike up his lactate. And, and Brett Hawk last week as well said the same thing. So <laughs> they're the nasty ones. I mean, I was pleased that I was swimming the deck level pool so I could just like get over the edge and throw something down the side if I was going to yeah. <laughs> like yeah when I was like younger it was like a proper side to the pool that's no good if you're doing that yeah <laughs> it's throwing up that cereal <laughs> yeah exactly there go the properties they're great <laughs> uh, so what is it like working at Speedo International? So you're, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, head of marketing at Speedo International? Well, it's Speedo Pacific. So, yeah, I, I'm, yep. I'm over here in Oz now. I was working for Speedo International before I came here, and I was heading up the sponsorship, um, the global sponsorship role. Um, so, I mean, that was, that was a pretty cool job was like uh traveling the world a lot going to the major meets yep. um and uh yeah i mean the, the thing for me was um with that role after doing london and rio olympics I, ra I ran the project team for rio was like i had a young family and i was trying to find something that was a little bit less uh travel like around i was like oh, a third of the year out of the UK at different things and meeting FINA or meeting e event committees and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's a, it's a good role if you're, if you're fairly young like I was in my early 30s. But I think the, uh, the interesting thing is people think of Speedo like it's a um, huge organization like Nike or Adidas, but 
it's actually a really tiny organization. So people generally thought I, you turning up with like a multi-million dollar checkbook uh, and you're really <laughs> not. So that's, that was the, the main challenge, I would say. But it's a, it's a really small, tight-knit group of people. So, you know, e even, um, even the international brand is less than 200 people in the UK. Um, and, you know, I mean, you know, your Addies are thousands and thousands and your Nike thousands and thousands of people um, and the team here in Australia is you know sm smaller again you know you're talking yeah. 35 people um, across uh, across everything that we do um, which which I mean is, is is bigger than quite a few other swim brands for sure but you know I think the the, the name Speedo makes people think of these the, these big sports organizations and I think what Speedo's done over time is punch well above its weight um, because of its presence on that international stage at the Olympics and sponsoring the you know, Australian team and key athletes in the American team and, and stuff like that. It's always been sort of like punching higher than, uh, than really it probably should for the size of organization that it is. And it has a, quite a family feel about it, which has always been nice. Um, and I think that's uh, that, that that's a good side to working for the brand in that people really want to help. You know, um, Suki Brownston, who works as our sports marketing and does all of our sponsorships. Um, I mean, everybody knows her around every pool deck. Yep. You know, she's always there wanting to help. And that's really what Speedo is, you know, like just being, uh, being present, being ready to help. You know, and that's, that's been a, a joy to be part of, uh, I'd say. So, yeah, that's, that's what I'd say it's like to work is you, you're doing more than you think because it's a smaller organization, but it's a good family to work for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite experience? Uh, that you've had at uh, at Speedo, so you've been on a lot of trips. You said, as as you said before, um, did you have a favourite, or it doesn't necessarily have to be a trip away, um, just a, a normal general experience that you've had with Speedo? Well, um, you know, uh, I, I, it's like climbing lots. Unfortunately, when you're kind of leading an event you don't really get to smell the roses too much. You know, in London, you're just like running around trying to sort out athletes, trying to make sure you've got your social media going, trying to make sure there's so much going on. And then, you know, there's the Speedo Olympic party, you're trying to make sure what how that's going to work out. So uh, as much as um, like you, you, you kind of know that you're at a, a great event, you're kind of also that busy that, you don't sort of just enjoy it. You're not a spectator. I've always said yeah. I'm really keen to go to an Olympics and just be the spectator and watch it rather than having to take part. And we've done some cool photo shoots that will um, that there was you know a little bit a little bit more relaxed uh, and the athletes even more relaxed than that. They uh, they enjoy themselves a heck of a lot. Um, after Kazan World Championships in 2015. We um, we flew uh, a load of athletes down to Montenegro for a photo shoot, and that was a pretty cool. Um, yeah, we we managed to get the, the owners of the Speedo brand that own like ten brands in the, in the UK. Uh, the Rubin family helped us hire a private jet to fly them all to Montenegro, and then yeah, that was uh, that was like felt like was high. I was. Like, been a bit of a high roller for a, for a little bit back there but um yeah i mean uh, I, I would say um moments really that stick in my mind are just being lucky enough to be sort of watching live some swims that you know uh I, you'll always remember for your whole life in london um you know seeing different like Ledecky swims so fast and uh, what other um, certainly from a fly point of view seeing Chad LeClos win was yeah. pretty like oh crazy 
um, in uh, in in Rio. Rio was Rio was a crazy one, um, but it was fun. But it was crazy in terms of you know the uh, the Brazilians put on a, a really good uh, event, but it it kind of came together at the last minute. And yeah, um, yeah, it was good to see that. See Adam Peaty as a Brit go so fast was pretty cool. So yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about um, your radio and TV production company. So um, made in Manchester. Uh, yeah. So did you always want to have your own uh, production company for TV and radio? Well, what I mean, when I came out of swimming, I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do. And I'd already always enjoyed the media side of stuff. And um, I'd been doing a bit of commentary for BBC as a retired athlete and or semi-retired before I'd even finished. I was doing some bits of events when I wasn't taking part and doing that sort yep. of you know, athlete stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I fancy doing that a bit. And I was doing um, as well some radio stuff. And one of the uh, one of the managers of a radio station was like, look, I want to get out of... Um, being in the corporate world and want to set up something are you keen to do that and I was like yeah I was keen to do it I, su I suppose I always thought I might be on the on the front end of it presenting and I ended up being behind the scenes like produce help producing and and, and stuff like that um, and I was doing that as well as um, sort of still had a little finger in the speedo pie they were uh, they were getting me to consult and do different do different bits within sports marketing and doing media stuff, doing the social media videos and podcasts. And it was all pretty new in those days, the whole social media side of stuff. I mean, it's just, you can't really believe that 10 years ago, it didn't really exist. It's like, yeah. what? In 2010, <laughs> it didn't really exist that much. It was a bit of Facebook and that was it, you know? So, um, yeah, we were doing that. Did I always want to have a... I mean, I don't know. I thought I was going to be more in media, I suppose. Uh, yeah. In my mind, I thought that was the thing that I might move towards uh, when I was sort of coming out of swimming. Then I ended up behind the scenes in it and uh, helping make the programs and, and stuff. And that was that was really interesting. It was good. Um, and so, yeah, the things just evolved on the speedo front more and more and more. And they were like, come on, come and work with us. And... Actually, I, my, I met my wife who was working there as well. And so uh, all roads were leading to Rome in terms of like working for Speedo. It was like, uh, you know, I was going out with one of the designers there and they were saying, come work. <laughs> so I spoke to my business partner and said, look, it probably makes sense that I go in that direction. And so, yeah, I still, I'm still, still, you know, a, a, a founding member and silent sort of owner of it. I, well, I say silent. I, no, I don't have any involvement in the running, but I still speak to the guys that made in Manchester and uh, see what they're up yeah. to and listen to what they're going on and making and programs they're doing and stuff like that. Mm. Um, who was the most inter interesting person that you that you had on Made in Man Manchester? Um, well, I mean, we when I was producing stuff. Um, I, I tell you, the person I, I found quite interesting was um, uh, an actor called David Jason, who is in Only Fools and Horses, is a voice of Danger Mouse. Um, he has been, well, he was the original voice, I should say, and just an iconic British comedic actor who, you know, uh, was just had stories to tell of things that you can remember growing up that you're just like, oh, no way. You know, Danger Mouse, back when I grew up, there was four TV channels in the UK and Danger Mouse was like, you got no choice, you're watching it. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing on TV and things like that. So, yeah, I'd say, yeah, it was interesting meeting those characters that have been around um, your, your, your childhood growing up and asking them questions about and them telling stories. Yeah. Um, do you have any any advice for me uh, for the Shack series and how to get it uh, better or a wider audience? <laughs> uh, well, 
I, do you know that's funny you should say that because I'd say I think I've I've seen a few of the podcasts. I think they're good. I think they're a very good interviewer. Um, <laughs> I would say be prepared to go with the flow a bit more often with what you hear and yeah. sack off the questions if you need to. You know, you yeah. see some great interviewers. Um, I mean, I look back, you've probably YouTube the Michael Parkinson was a massive one in the UK. And, like, just be prepared when you've got, you know, a really interesting character going down a, a path. Just take the path. The audience yeah. want you to take it, so go for it. Yeah. But, yeah, then in terms of, like, spreading the word, I think, yeah, I think we need the, the marketing side of stuff probably would be, you know, I, I, I reposted a little bit on mine, trying to make sure the, the people you've got coming on are getting it onto their channel is important. Um, yeah. Most people are, I see, but some people haven't. So where they can, uh, that, that'll help. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, I'll take yeah. that on board. <laughs> um, so who did you look up to as a kid uh, growing up? Well, look, my, my for the thing that turned me into, right, I want to be an Olympic swimmer was uh, a Brit swimmer called Adrian Morehouse, who he did, he won gold. I mean, he's like sort of Adam Peaty of the day because um, 100 breaststroker, which I couldn't do. But that, I mean, it doesn't matter when you're a kid. So when, he, when I was 12, um, uh, just like swimming, I'd chosen out of those two sports. I mean, he was my sort of heroic inspiration, let's put it that way. And then, and then as I sort of progressed into, uh, into, my, into my events and uh, the, the fly events, you know, Matt Biondi was definitely somebody that I looked up to in that 100 fly space. There was a, a Brit called Andy Jameson who won bronze um, in, 90, in 88 as well, actually. Um, and then, you know, like, as I started to sort of get a bit better myself, um, I, was, I wouldn't say I was so much looking up to people, but looking out for competition. So Denis Pankratov was my sort of era competition. And that motivated me in training because I was always a bit like, I don't want any, I don't, I don't want a Russian to beat me. I'm a Brit. I'm really, I want to win. So I'd train hard thinking there's some Russian or there's some Aussie getting up to, to do an extra training session somewhere. So I'm going to get up and do it. And then I was racing, you know, Clinny was like a good competitor of mine. I broke his hundred fly world short course record. Um, yeah. I think he then broke mine back. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Skippy as well. Um, <laughs> Jeff Hugel. Uh, yeah. you know, not, not so much, looking up but you know we became sort of rivals and I always felt rivalry was a good thing you know to spur you on to something better um, and there was a big competitor that I had in the UK called Stephen Parry um, and he he was great but he he left to go to the USA he became NC2A champion um, and when he come back and race trials and uh, and race for the major events, Com Games and Europeans, he would be back from the states and we'd be racing. You know, I didn't know how. Well, I could see a little bit of how he was going in the states, but you, you know, he, it's a little bit removed. So he'd come back, and so that was a good motivation for me. Um, and we we were always in the same in the same finals, right? Racing each other, you know, European finals, World finals. Uh, Olympic finals, there we were, yeah. you know, like against each other. Did you always have someone that you looked forward to beating? So someone who you'd you'd have Even that rivalry Barry, exactly. for so long? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it was funny because it kind of because uh, um, I I was a year older than him and just that bit further ahead. So like you know, of ten years of racing each other, like, I probably beat him for the first four or five years, always, no problem. Yep. And then for the next sort of few years, like Steve would come in and win a few. I'd be like, what's going on here? Like, who does he think he is? Um, <laughs> but then, you know, like for the last sort of three years, it was just great to have someone. We were, I mean, we were so close in terms of, 
uh, he would he definitely started to be a bit better long course than me and he got the bronze medal in Athens in 2004 and so but the short course piece I'd always remained that little bit in front there and uh, so yeah you know um, it was it was it was good I mean internationally um, I think the Australian Brit rivalry was good for me you know Skippy and Klimi and um, and then I mean for the 200 there was a guy called Scott Goodman and Scott Miller was the 100 fly swimmer that did commies in that yeah. too so yeah that was good Daniel Loder from New Zealand god what a talent he was he kind of came and went like overnight and I always thought he had way money more years in him and longevity is an interesting yeah. thing being able to stay in the sport is hard and if you can do it yeah you generally can win out quite a bit just mm. by staying alive and just by mm. even through the bad times and I had some really bad years and there was times I was going to give up twice I was like oh, I'm done it's not gonna it's not gonna happen but my support network was good enough to be like you, you're not done you're not you're not you know there's no need to stop yet I mean my coach actually didn't didn't even think I should have stopped in 2004 he's like what what are you doing why are you stopping now you just won the world short course for the fifth time I mean and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's why, man, that's why I want to stop having done that and uh, keep, 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 keep off on a high if I can. Yeah, you should have thrown it back at him, all those fly sessions after all those years. You've yeah. forced me out. <laughs> I kill me. I had a deal with them. Um, so Terry Dennison, who I went to train with, he did the... It did like the, the sort of central part of my international career. I mean, I had a great base to put in with an age group coach. And then I went to work with Terry, who had coached Adrian to his gold medal. Uh, and then he retired. And um, I, I, and I did the last couple of years with a, a coach called Paul Remmons in Manchester, my hometown. And that's why Made in Manchester was called Made in Manchester, because that's where yeah. I'm made from myself and that's where we were making all the tv productions but um yeah the uh the the, the times i wanted to stop um were definitely there but without the support network of people going you can you, you can keep going then yeah i wouldn't have got through that and then i was turning up for training like because i was just enjoying it and socializing and that's what i was encouraged to do and then, you know, the bad year went through and I came back out the other side and, uh, and, and managed to keep going. So, um, yeah, it can happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, who are you most excited to see compete next year? Is there, do you have a favourite current swimmer? And is there someone that you're just really, really looking forward to racing next year? Well, I've got a ton of Aussie swimmers I'm excited to see, yeah. you know, that are in the speedo fold, of course they are. Um, yeah. Arnie, definitely, everyone wants to see how Arnie's going to go, I'm sure they do. Um, yeah. I, I'm interested to see how Clyde goes. I think he could really be an eye-opener. Um, yeah. I think Elijah as well. I'm keen to see how he can progress next year. Um, yeah, there's quite a few um, as well. Minna as well, of course. Yeah. Um, yep. She swam so fast sort of last year and was really... It's just like... It's so interesting to see how this year is going to work for people. Some people it will have worked for and some people it totally won't. You know, our, the, the guys that um, are, are, have been around Speedo for some time, we've got Mac and, Mac and Emma, you know, like the extra year, whether they really wanted the extra year or not, well, we'll <laughs> see, you know, they've been doing it for quite some time. And, but, you know, for, for some of those older athletes where, I mean, I don't know, but there'll be some older athletes where, you know, maybe they were feeling, oh, I'm just not the – a bit injury prone or a bit on this verge of stuff, but this extra year just lets me get over it. We might see a couple of a couple of the old 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 boys and old girls go, yeah, there's yeah. a bit more life in the old dog yet. 
So yeah, <laughs> such an interesting, uh, such an interesting one. But yeah, I'd say, I think certainly that on the on the Aussie side, um, and you know, there's a, there's, I, I'm interested as well from the Brit side because of you know being the ex Brit and all that. Definitely yep. want to see whether Adam's going to keep going so fast. He's about to be. Um, about to be a father as well and that really changes the dynamic of your world so yeah yeah it's gonna be great to just uh see how it unfolds next year yeah um so you've won five world titles in a row uh for the China fly did you have a favorite achievement out of all those or what were one of those your favorite achievement and if so why right well i talk about like uh, I was lucky. First of all, I'm going to say I was lucky because Fina changed the the year they did short course. So I managed to get two over two years because 99, they were doing them odd years. So I got 97, 99, yep. and then they moved into even years. So I got 2000 straight after, and then <laughs> 2002, 2004. Now, if they hadn't done that, I wouldn't have got five because it has to have gone to 2005 so that's kind of lucky but um yeah i mean any any sort of like long-term piece like that for me um talk about like the first one's always important kind of validates you so the first one yeah. was sort of like yeah oh i am kind of worthy of being on this stage all that hard work was worth it and that's good and that was the springboard to getting on with other things like you know the the next year broke the world record for the 200 fly um as well so that that really helped there and i'd say the then the, the so there's like three mountains it was that first one the world record in the turn of fly and then the last 200 fly because when you're old and you've been doing it a lot of times the the emphasis changes from being the hunter to being hunted and it's yeah. a very different when you're being hunted it's a little bit more it's a different view than when you're like chasing it you know when you're like oh, i want to beat them i want to beat that and that that's chasing it but when you're like you know everyone's going it's time we beat him <laughs> he's got to get beat. he can't be getting any younger so yeah the fifth one was like really cool really special to in terms of like that, that felt great but you know, like the, the uh, you just various different other like meets and events were cool to go to and be part of and experience and soak it up. Sydney Olympics was sensational. Might be a minute. Hey, hey James, James, how are you? Yeah, good man. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, what have you been up to this weekend? Oh, you know, family stuff, really. Um, I got, got two kids, so we were taekwondo, gymnastics. This morning, I went for a swim, uh, ocean swim, with a couple of mates. And mm. then we had some other, like, sort of family, friends, kids round, and trash. <laughs> oh, How about you? What have you been up to? Sorry? How about you? What have you been up to? Uh, I've, I was out camping uh, all weekend. So I went up, up the coast with a few mates. And, yeah, we just we just had a bit of a camping trip ready for another tough week uh, in the pool this week. So, yeah. How far did you go this week? How far in, in kilometres? Yeah. Um. Geez, not too far. We're only just getting back in the swing of things. Uh, so I think we're averaging about a uh, 6K session. So not not too bad. 60K? Yeah. 10 sessions? No, we're, we did um, eight this week. All right. Yeah. So, 48K. yeah. Nothing, breeze, nothing too tough. Sorry? 48K is a breeze. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. Well, I've just come back from a broken leg, so uh, i just got to ease into it. <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. Well, thanks thanks so much for coming on, uh, James. And, um, yeah, we've just got a few questions here for you, um, just from your, your swimming career. Um, 
your working career and um, also your um, your radio and TV production company that you've that you've also got as well. Um, so we'll kick off. Uh, when did you start swimming? Yeah, well, so it was early days. Uh, like as a young, I don't know. I mean, I can't remember not being swimming. You know, like a lot of people, I suppose. But um, like that was all learned to swim. Like, and then I started into a club uh, type environment when I was like uh, eight, about eight years old. Uh, I was sort of like getting into the club stuff. I was doing swimming and gymnastics together because I had so much energy when I was a kid. My parents mm -hmm. were like, get him into sport. So, yeah, yeah I got him yeah. to do swimming and gymnastics and had to decide uh, about, you know, a couple of years in because uh, they were like, progressing to like four nights a week for each and then it's like do you want to do swimming or do you want to do gymnastics and I enjoyed swimming more which is why I chose mm. and I think that's the right choice at, like to go for what you enjoy especially if you're trying to do sport because you know there's tough times and if you're not doing something you enjoy doing like when the tough times come you know you still need to enjoy it and so yeah mm. so yeah it was like um like eight, eight till ten, I was doing swim gymnastics. About ten, that's when I decided just to do the swim thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of young kids actually do a lot of um, different sports, and I, for one, yeah, was very heavily involved with rugby league. And then it just got to an age where, you know, swimming is so so demanding, and you're you're doing, you know, at sixteen you can be doing between seven or ten sessions a week, and it's just like. You know, if you wanna if you wanna make it, you gotta really tuck it in and really yeah, get get going on all those sessions. So there's no there's no sessions off, otherwise you know, you're just not gonna make it in a sport like swimming. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so uh did you always enjoy swimming? Um, even at a competitive level, you know those hard training blocks it's quite natural to also feel unmotivated. Um, so in, during your entire swimming career, did you, were you always enjoying it? You know, like I'm going to say uh, the, the feeling like you get after a swim session, even when, even when life isn't going in the, in, a, in the right place all the time is, is usually good for me anyway. Mm. So even when I was like having bad sort of meets, um, the training, I still kind of, you know, you got, got the endorphins. It's where my friends were anyway. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think generally uh, it was, it, 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 it still is, you know, like that piece for me that is so important to just keep swimming. Uh, and, yeah, I enjoy it. I mean, literally, it was that, I, I always, I've talked about this quite a few times, as you might imagine, and I, I go back to, I chose to do something I enjoy doing and that's really important because, yeah. you, you know, like I, I still enjoy swimming now and I'm not really going for anything crazy, but uh, just, just like, like being in the water and mm. yeah, there's just times when it's, for me, it's very meditative. Uh, like when you get to a point where you can swim and it's no effort and you just, your mind can wander, you know, I can just relax and relax and relax and relax. People, people ask you those questions when you're a swimmer, like, how far can you swim? You're like, well, I could just swim for, for all day, you know, like, yeah. keep going. It's not, there's not like an end point for me, to be honest. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so swimmers are known for their, quite big appetites um so first food question is what was your go-to snack before training um i reckon my go-to snack was uh, generally like bowls of cereal like uh, that was my yep. go-to like you know get a bowl of cereal in and get in the car and get to training and yeah i mean a bowl of cereal was pretty much the 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 go-to piece uh for me i reckon what type of cereal were you into well uh I don't know if they had it here. I mean, I maybe have Frosties. Was Frosties? Yeah. Uh, Kellogg's Frosties. Oh man, I, yeah. They're so sugary. <laughs> they're so bad. But flipping, out, I love them. I I used to go through boxes and boxes of them bad boys. But um, but yeah, I mean, I pretty I I, I could eat 
different stuff, but I think Frosties yeah. is top of the. Yeah, they're great. yeah, I, I love Frosties. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> Yeah, my mum had to stop me from eating them, otherwise I wouldn't have any teeth left, so... Yeah, same, same. I haven't got <laughs> much teeth left. Uh, so, favourite food after a tough session? So, you've, you've yeah. done one of your gruelling fly sessions, and you get home, what is your favourite food to tuck into? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I think pizza is quite high on the list. Um, I mean, like, back in the day it was, anyway. I was just, like, a carb monster then. Like, I, like one of my favourite dishes that was probably, like, I ate a lot, like, would be a salmon pasta. Like, pasta, mm. creamy salmon pasta with peas. And just, uh, that, that was something that I really quite liked a bit. But there's nothing like after, if you've done a mama session smashing in quite a bit of pizza carb and re yeah. regenerating that way yeah yeah definitely i'm the exact same pizza always gets me <laughs> fills me up man so well, i did it does now even more but that's a different story yeah <laughs> um so next question hardest swim session that you've ever done so we had uh lachlan staples who who was another great australian uh 200 butterfly and yeah. um, he what mentioned he that he'd done. That yeah, so, oh, hardest swim session that you've ever done. Um, yeah, Lachlan Staples, he, he mentioned uh, doing 3K fly sessions that he quite enjoyed. Are you as crazy as him and enjoyed those long, long fly sessions? Or what was the hardest one that you've ever done? And, and secondly, yeah, what was your favourite favorite one that you've ever done? Okay, yeah, good good question. So, tough air fly sessions well, I had a pretty crazy coach that I had to use we did like about a 3k fly set on a, um, a Monday morning a Tuesday night a Thursday morning and a Friday night so I was always swimming that against the girl middle distance freestylers so you'd be doing something like 12 300s uh, or or 15 200s like that was <laughs> four times a week so I was no getting away yeah. from doing distance fly and um, yeah I mean I kind of got to a point where and you know we so I also talked about it with my coach which was if you can get to a point of trying to swim fly like you swim freestyle which is you know get into the rhythm and just nail it out keep going keep going keep going and um, so yeah, those sort of sessions were all right. I mean, big sessions. We used to do some 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 crazy stuff. We'd have Hell Week, and big sessions would be like I can remember doing uh, two four thousand medleys was a Hell Week regular. So that's one thousand fly, one thousand back, one thousand breast, one thousand free twice. That's eight k sessions done. Um, what else? I mean, you always did like the hundred hundreds, but we never did the hundred hundreds. We'd always do like yeah. uh, not 101 because everybody does 100 hundreds and quite a few people think about doing 101 hundreds to beat everyone. We always did 103 hundreds and yeah. I did them a few times free fly. So it'd be free up, fly back, uh, like off like 80 long course doing 103 hundreds. <laughs> I remember a big session that I did with, I used to train with uh, Graham Smith, who is a mile swimmer, he got bronze in, a, in Atlanta. Um, and he was always, I mean, I never felt sorry for myself because he was always in the pool after me anyway, like mm. slugging out more meters, even though I was doing pretty big sessions. But we did a, a session, which was 11.3, 11.3. Uh, 11 that was my biggest ever one session that I swam his session. Um, and then I remember in the swim down, why you've got to do a swim down at the end of that, I don't know. But I remember in the swim yeah. down, kind of breaststroke. And, uh, and I, couldn't, my, my, I couldn't turn my legs. I've done so much freestyle. I couldn't turn my legs out properly. Like, it was like, oh, man. No wonder he can't do any breaststroke. <laughs> so, yeah, there's yeah, not many distance swimmers that can. Yeah, 10 800 fly I did one time. That was pretty... Ah. Um, but... Yeah, and uh, quite a few 400s fly. I remember doing a lot of 400s fly. And they're, yeah. they're like the distance wow. ones, but I can tell you the ones that hurt the most were more like the lactate ones where 
I'd end up having to do, uh, you do like a 75 max and then take 15 seconds and then have to do the um, set the last 25. If I was doing it, I'd do a short cut session like this. So 75 max, 15 seconds, last 25 underwater, just to max that last turn. And yeah. I'd do eight of those, but... Oh, I was like feeling so lactic sick at the end of eight of those. It was pretty mad. It's funny because, yeah, Lachlan said the exact same thing. He said uh, the 3K sessions are fun, but yeah, anything to spike up his lactate. And, and Brett Hawk last week as well said the same thing. So <laughs> They're the nasty ones. I mean, I was pleased that I was swimming in a deck level pool so I could just like get over the edge and throw something down the side if yeah. I was going to yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, uh, when I was, like, younger, it was, like, a proper side to the pool. That's no good if you're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> it's throwing up that cereal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there go the properties. They're great. <laughs> uh, so... What is it like working at Speedo International? So you're, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, head of marketing at Speedo International? Well, it's Speedo Pacific. So, yeah, I, I'm, yep. I'm over here in Oz now. I was working for Speedo International before I came here, and I was heading up the sponsorship, um, the global sponsorship role. Um, so, I mean, that was, that was a pretty cool job was like uh traveling the world a lot going to the major meets yep. um and uh yeah i mean the, the thing for me was um with that role after doing london and rio olympics I, ra I ran the project team for rio was like i had a young family and i was trying to find something that was a little bit less uh travel like around i was like oh, the third of the year out of the UK at different things and meeting FINA or meeting e event committees and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's a, it's a good role if you're, if you're fairly young like I was in my early 30s. But I think the, uh, the interesting thing is people think of Speedo like it's a um, huge organization like Nike or Adidas, but it's actually a really tiny organization. So people generally thought like, you're turning up with like a multi-million dollar checkbook uh, and you're really <laughs> not. So that's, that was the, the main challenge, I would say. But it's a, it's a really small, tight-knit group of people. So, you know, e even, um, even the international brand is less than 200 people in the UK. Um, and, you know, I mean, you know, your Addies are thousands and thousands in your night thousands and thousands of people um, and the team here in Australia is you know sm smaller again you know you're talking yeah. 35 people um, across uh, across everything that we do um, which which I mean is, is is bigger than quite a few other swim brands for sure but you know I think the the, the name Speedo makes people think of these the, these big sports organizations and I think what Speedo's done over time is punch well above its weight um, because of its presence on that international stage at the Olympics and sponsoring the you know, Australian team and key athletes in the American team and, and stuff like that. It's always been sort of like punching higher than, uh, than really it probably should for the size of organization that it is. And it has a, quite a family feel about it, which has always been nice. Um, and I think that's, uh, that, that, that's a good side to working for the brand in that people really want to help, you know. Um, Suki Brownston, who works as our sports marketing and does all of our sponsorships. Um, I mean, everybody knows her around every pool deck. Yeah. You know, she's always there wanting to help. And that's really what Speedo is, you know, like just being, uh, being present, being ready to help. You know, and that's, that's been a, a joy to be part of, uh, I'd say. So, yeah, that's, that's what I'd say it's like to work is you, you're doing more than you think because it's a smaller organization, but it's a good family to work for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite experience? Uh, that you've had at uh, at Speedo. So you've been on 
a lot of trips, you said, as, as you said before. Um, did you have a favourite or it doesn't necessarily have to be a trip away, um, just a, a normal general experience that you've had with Speedo? Well, um, you know, uh, I, I, it's like climbing lots. Unfortunately, when you're kind of leading an event, you, you don't really get to smell the roses too much. You know, in London, you're just like running around trying to sort out athletes, trying to make sure you've got your social media going, trying to make sure <laughs> there's so much going on. And then, you know, there's the Speedo Olympic party, you're trying to make sure what how that's going to work out. So uh, as much as um, like you, you, you kind of know that you're at a, a great event, you're kind of also that busy that you, you don't sort of just enjoy it. You're not a spectator. I've always said yeah. I'm really keen to go to an Olympics and just be the spectator and watch it rather than having to take part. And we've done some cool photo shoots that will um, that there was you know a little bit a little bit more relaxed uh, and the athletes even more relaxed than that. They, uh, they enjoy themselves a heck of a lot. Um, after Kazan World Championships in 2015, we, um, we flew uh, a load of athletes down to Montenegro for a photo shoot. And that was a pretty cool, um, yeah, we, we managed to get the, the owners of the Speedo brand that own like 10 brands in, uh, in the UK. Uh, the Ruben family helped us hire a private jet to fly them all to Montenegro. And then, yeah, that was, uh, that was like, it felt like it was high. I was like, being a bit of a high roller for a, for a little bit back there. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would say um, moments really that stick in my mind are just being lucky enough to be sort of watching live some swims that, you know, uh, You'll always remember for your whole life in London, um, you know, seeing different, like Ledecky swim so fast and uh, what other, um, certainly from a fly point of view, seeing Chad Leclo win was yeah. pretty like, oh, crazy. Um, in, uh, in, in Rio, Rio was... Rio was a crazy one, um, but it was fun, but it was crazy in terms of, you know, the uh, the Brazilians put on a, a really good uh, event, but it, it kind of came together at the last minute. And yeah, uh, yeah, it was good to see that. See Adam Peaty as a Brit go so fast was pretty cool. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about... Um your radio and TV production company. So um, made in Manchester. Uh, yeah. So did you always want to have your own uh, production company for TV and radio? Well, what I mean, when I came out of swimming, I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do. And I'd already always enjoyed the media side of stuff. And um, I'd been doing a bit of commentary for BBC as a retired athlete and or semi-retired before I'd even finished I was doing some bits of events when I wasn't taking part and doing that sort yep. of you know, athlete stuff and I was like yeah 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 I fancy doing that a bit and I was doing um as well some radio stuff and one of the uh one of the managers of a radio station was like look I want to get out of um being in the corporate world and want to set up something are you keen to do that and I was like yeah I was keen to do it I, su I suppose I always thought I might be on the on the front end of it presenting and I ended up being behind the scenes like produce help producing and and, and stuff like that um, and I was doing that as well as um, sort of still had a little finger in the speedo pie they were uh, they were getting me to consult and do different do different bits within sports marketing and doing media stuff, doing the social media videos and podcasts. And it was all pretty new in those days, the whole social media side of stuff. I mean, it's just, you can't really believe that 10 years ago, it didn't really exist. It's like, yeah. what? In 2010, <laughs> it didn't really exist that much. It was a bit of Facebook and that was it, you know? So, um, yeah, we were doing that. Did I always want to have a... I mean, I, don't know, I thought I was going to be more in media, I suppose. Uh, 
yeah. in my mind, I thought that was the thing that I might move towards uh, when I was sort of coming out of swimming. Then I ended up behind the scenes in it and uh, helping make the programs and, and stuff. And that was, that was really interesting. It was good. Um, and so, yeah, the things just evolved on the speedo front more and more and more. And they were like, come on, come and work with us. And actually, I, my, I met my wife who was working there as well. And so all roads were leading to Rome in terms of like working for speedo. It was like, uh, you know, I was going out with one of the designers there and they were saying, come work. With so I spoke to my business partner and said, look, it probably makes sense that I go in that direction. And so, yeah, I still, I'm still a, you know, a, a, a founding member and silent sort of owner of it. I, well, I say silent. I, I don't have any involvement in the running, but I still speak to the guys that made in Manchester and uh, see what they're up yeah. to and listen to what they're going on and making and programs they're doing and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, who is the most inter interesting person that you that you had on Made in Manchester? Um, well, I mean, we, the, when I was producing stuff, um, I I tell you the person I I found quite interesting was um, uh, an actor called David Jason, who was in Only Fools and Horses, The Voice of Danger Mouse. Um, he has been well. He was the original voice, I should say, and just an iconic British comedic actor who, you know, uh, was just had stories to tell of things that you can remember growing up that you're just like, oh no way, you know, Danger Mouse. Back when I grew up, there was four TV channels in the UK, and Danger Mouse was like, you got no choice, you're watching it. <laughs> the only thing on TV. And things like that. So, yeah, I'd say, yeah, it was interesting meeting those characters that have been around um, your, your, your childhood growing up and asking them questions about and them telling stories. Yeah. Um, do you have any, any advice for me uh, for the Shack series and how to get it uh, better or a wider audience? <laughs> uh well, do you know, that's funny you should say that, because I'd say, I think, I've, I've seen a few of the podcasts, I think they're good, I think you're a very good interviewer, um, <laughs> I would say, be prepared to go with the flow a bit more often with what you hear, and yeah. sack off the questions if you need to, you know, you yeah. see some great interviewers, um, I mean, I look back, you probably YouTube, the Michael Parkinson was a massive one in the UK, and like, just be prepared when you've got, you know, a really interesting character going down a, a path. Just take the path. The audience yeah. want you to take it, so go for it. Yeah. But yeah, then in terms of like spreading the word, I think, yeah, I think we need that the marketing side of stuff probably would be, you know, I, I, I reposted a little bit on mine, trying to make sure the, the people you've got coming on are getting it onto their channel is important. Um, yeah. Most people are, I see, but some people haven't. So where they can, uh, that that'll help. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, I'll take yeah. that on board. <laughs> um. So who did you look up to as a kid uh, growing up? Well, look, my, my for the thing that turned me into right, I want to be an Olympic swimmer was uh, a Brit swimmer called Adrian Morehouse, who. He did. He won gold. I mean, he's like sort of Adam Peaty of the day, because um, a hundred mm. breaststroker, which I couldn't do. But uh, I mean, it doesn't matter when you're a kid. So when he, when I was twelve, and uh, just like swimming, I'd chosen that of those two sports. I mean, he was my sort of heroic inspiration. Let's put it that way. And then, and then as I sort of progressed into uh, into my into my events. And uh, the the fly events, you know, Matt Biondi was definitely somebody that I looked up to in that hundred fly space. There was a a Brit called Andy Jameson who won bronze, um, in ninety in eighty eight as well, actually. Um, and then, you know, like as I started to sort of get a bit better myself. Um, I, was, I wouldn't say I was so much looking up to people, but looking out for competition. So Denis Pankratov was my sort of era competition. 
And that motivated me in training because I was always a bit like, I don't want any, I don't, I don't want a Russian to beat me. I'm a Brit, I'm really, I want to win. So I'd train hard thinking there's some Russian or there's some Aussie getting up to, to do an extra training session somewhere. So I'm going to get up and do it. And then I was racing. You know, Clinny was like a good competitor of mine. I broke his 100 fly wheel short course record. Um, yeah. I think he then broke mine back. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Skippy as well. Um, yeah. Jeff Hubel. Uh, yeah. you know, not, not so much looking up, but, you know, we became sort of rivals. And I always felt rivalry was a good thing, you know, to spur you on to something better. Um, and there was a big competitor that I had in the UK called Stephen Parry. Um, and he he was great, but he, he left to go to the USA. He became NC2A champion. Um, and when he come back and race trials and, uh, and race for the major events, Com Games and Europeans, he would be back from the States and we'd be racing. You know, I didn't know how, well, I could see a little bit of how he was going in the States, but, you, you know, he, it's a little bit removed, so he'd come back. And so that was a good motivation for me. Um, and we, we were always in the same in the same finals, right, racing each other, you know, European finals, world finals, uh, Olympic finals. There we were, yeah. you know, like against each other. Did you always have someone that you – looked forward to beating so someone who you'd you'd have that rivalry for so long yeah (laughs) (laughs) no i mean it was funny because it kind of uh um because i I was a year older than him and just that bit further ahead so like you know of 10 years of racing each other i probably beat him for the first four or five years always no problem yeah and then for the next sort of few years like steve would come in and win a few i'd be like what's going on here? Like, who does he think he is? Um, but then, you know, like for the last sort of three years, it was just great to have someone, we were, I mean, we were so close in terms of, uh, he would, he definitely started to be a bit better long course than me and he got the bronze medal in Athens in 2004. And so, but the short course piece, I'd always remained that little bit, in front there and uh so yeah you know um it was it was it was good i mean internationally um i think the australian brit rivalry was good for me you know skippy and clemmy and um and then i mean for the 200 there was a guy called scott goodman and scott miller was the 100 fly swimmer that did commies in that yeah. so yeah that was good daniel loader from new zealand god what a talent he was he kind of came and went like overnight and i always thought he had way money more years in him and longevity is an interesting yeah. thing being able to stay in the sport is hard and if you can do it yeah you generally can win out quite a bit just mm. by staying alive and just by mm. even through the bad times and i had some really bad years and there was times i was gonna give up twice i was like oh, i'm done it's not gonna it's not gonna happen but my support network was good enough to be like you're not done you're not you're not you know there's no need to stop yet i mean my coach actually didn't didn't even think i should have stopped in 2004 he's like what what are you doing why are you stopping now you just won the world short course for the fifth time i mean and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's why, man. That's why. I want to stop having done that and uh, keep 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 off on a high if I can. Yeah, you should have thrown it back at him. All those fly sessions for, after all those years, you've yeah. forced me out. <laughs> you like, kill me. I had a deal with um, so Terry Dennison, who I went to train with, he did the did, did like the, the sort of central part of my international career. I mean, I had a great base to put in with an age group coach. And then I went to work with Terry, who had coached Adrian to his gold medal. Uh, and then he retired. And um, I, I, and I did the last couple of years with a, a coach called Paul Remmons in Manchester, my hometown. And that's why Made in Manchester was called Made in Manchester, because that's where yeah. I'm made from myself and that's where we were making all the tv productions 
But um, yeah, the, uh, the 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 times I wanted to stop um, were definitely there, but without the support network of people going, you can you, you can keep going. Then yeah, I wouldn't have got through that. And then I was turning up for training, like because I was just enjoying it and socialising, and that's what I was encouraged to do. And then you know the bad year went through, and I came back out the other side, and uh, and, and managed to keep going. So um, yeah, it can happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, who are you most excited to see compete next year? Is there? Do you have a favourite current swimmer, and is there someone that you're just really, really looking forward to racing next year? Well, I've got a ton of Aussie swimmers I'm excited to see, yeah. you know, that are in the speedo fold, of course they are. Um, yeah. Arnie, definitely, everyone wants to see how Arnie's going to go, I'm sure they do. Um, yeah. I, I'm interested to see how Clyde goes. I think he could really be an eye-opener. Um, yeah. I think Elijah as well. I'm keen to see how he can progress next year. Um, yeah, there's quite a few um, as well. Minna as well, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. She swam so fast sort of last year and was really. It's just like it's so interesting to see how this year is going to work for people. Some people it will have worked for, and some people it totally won't. You know, our, the, the guys that um, are, are, have been around Speedo for some time, we've got Mac and, Mac and Emma, you know, like the extra year, whether they really wanted the extra year or not, well, we can <laughs> see, you know, they've been doing it for quite some time. And, but, you know, for, for some of those older athletes where, I mean, I don't know, but there'll be some older athletes where, you know, maybe they were feeling, oh, I'm just not the – a bit injury prone or a bit on this verge of stuff, but this extra year just lets me get over it. We might see a couple of a couple of the old 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 boys and old girls go, yeah, there's yeah. a bit more life in the old dog yet. So yeah, yeah it's <laughs> such an interesting uh, such an interesting one. But yeah, I'd say I think certainly that on the on the Aussie side, um, and you know, there's a there's, I, I'm interested as well from the Brit side. Because of you know being the ex Brit and all that, definitely yep. want to see whether Adam's going to keep going so fast. He's about to be um, about to be a father as well, and that really changes the dynamic of your world. So, yeah, yeah, it's going to be great to just uh, see how it unfolds next year. Yeah. Um, so you've won five world titles in a row uh, for the China Fly. Did you have a favourite achievement? out of all those or what were one of those your favorite achievement and if so why right well i talk about like uh i was lucky first of all i'm gonna say i was lucky because fina changed the the year they did short course so i managed to get two over two years because 99 they were doing them odd years so i got 97 99 yep. and then they moved into even years so i got 2000 straight after and then 2002 and 2004 now if they hadn't done that i wouldn't have got five because it have to have gone to 2005 so that's kind of lucky but um yeah i mean any any sort of like long-term piece like that for me um talk about like the first one's always important it kind of validates you so the first one yeah. was sort of like yeah oh i am kind of worthy of being on this stage all that hard work was worth it and that's good and that was the springboard to getting on with other things like you know the, the next year broke the world record for the 200 fly um as well so that that really helped there and i'd say the then the, the so there's like three mountains it was that first one the world record in the turn of fly and then the last 200 fly, because when you're old and you've been doing it a lot of times, the, the emphasis changes from being the hunter to being hunted. And it's yeah. very different. When you're being hunted, it's a little bit more, it's a different view than when you're like chasing it. You know, when you're like, oh, I want to beat them. I want to beat that. And that, that's chasing it. But when you're like, 
you know everyone's going, time we beat him. <laughs> He's got to get beat. He can't be getting any younger. So, yeah, the fifth one was, like, really cool, really special To in terms of, like, that, that felt great. But, you know, like, the, the uh, you just various different other, like, meets and events were cool to go to and be part of and experience and soak it up. Sydney Olympics was sensational Olympics to go to as a swimmer. So, yeah, so pleased to do that. And then in Athens... I won't ever forget the men's 200 free with Ian Thorpe, Peter van der Hoogerman, and some other guy called Michael Phelps thrown in the mix <laughs> just for just for shits and giggles. Yeah, I mean, I made a conscious choice. I pretty much knew that was going to be my last Olympics. And I was like, um, even though I probably should have not headed to the pool and rested up, I was like, because ah, I still had the medley relay to go. I was like, nah. I'm going to be poolside for that race because just it was just too epic not to be there to watch it. You've been to a lot of international events, so would that would that be your favourite all-time event to watch? That that one that that one race for me would probably be. It, it, I mean, it had a history of Sydney behind it, you know. I can talk about where we sat as the British team in Sydney. Um, on on the opening night, in the opening race is the 400 free, and we were sat opposite the big stand that they built for Sydney, one big 17,000 seat stand, which I'd never seen at a swimming pool before. I mean, there were like Atlanta mm. the year before, the, 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 the circle probably had nearly that many people, but that's not how they did it in Sydney. They put one massive 17,000 seat stand and then like three, 4,000 down at the bottom, including the athletes. And that very first race in Sydney um, and Thorpey came out and when they announced his name, Lane for Ian Thorpe and the crowd went, yeah, the hot breath <laughs> came down the stand and you felt it in your face and you were like, shit, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to go swim in front of all that. Wow. And it was just incredible. It was so good to, you know, just stand the hairs up on the back of your head and you're just like, yeah, amazing. So, yeah, those big those big moments were great to, to see and be part of. I was, I was really lucky to be working for Speedo in Beijing and saw Michael win, win it all eight of his races, eight yeah. gold medals, you know, like, Never thought you were going to see that. You thought Mark Spitz, you know, the, the fact that every now there was, you know, there was no semifinals then. There was, you know, the, 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 the across the board, more specialist racers had sort of yep. taken steps forward in each of the events. So, you know, you, you were like, oh, could that ever happen? But yeah, seeing that was um, absolutely incredible. I was so lucky to after Sydney Olympics um, and Michael came through there and you know I had the world short course record and the world champion short course and Michael was going I managed to go train with him um, over in Baltimore for a bit and that was that was you know really a really interesting great experience to see how he how he did it I mean look the guy's 15 maybe 16 then when I was doing that and I'm 23 yeah um and I mean, he could he could train. He was he used to get in. His warm ups were nearly flat out, and <laughs> I'm not joking. And then he just like every training session, I'd say he still had a little bit of naivety at that time about pacing a week's worth of training. And um, so there was a few training sessions where I probably outperformed him. I mean, there's definitely some way he outperformed me at 16 years old. But I think he burned himself out doing it and wasn't balancing the week. So I think, but he, I mean, he obviously cottoned on to that really. On my uh, battery, oh. my uh, cable. The battery's lying. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Hopefully that'll work. Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry. So. Your, we'll talk about a bit more about your mindset uh, heading into a big meet. So 
being being around the pool for quite a long time, um, like I, I've seen a lot of people that have, you know, a very calm mindset. A lot of people walk into the pool and they're just they, to race well. They need to really, really be pumped up and energetic. Um, you know, what what was your mindset heading into a major meet? Yeah, my, my mindset, I think, I, I would say, definitely nervous excitement. I'm nervous because you're nervous about your performance, obviously. Um, but I wouldn't say it was like necessarily a nervousness about uh, uh, like something going wrong. I thought it was more of a nervousness around uh, whether my performance was going to be good enough to achieve what I wanted to achieve. You know, so, like, I always felt like I'd given my best in the training pool, preparation. You know, I'd learned to get that good. You're trying to think about performing the – it's like executing is what I should say, the race, how you plan to execute it. So, I don't know, it's probably like uh, – in, in some ways, you might say it's more like – this I'm look. This is the first time I've ever said this. It's more like building a paper airplane, you know. Yeah. Like you got to get you. You know how to build a paper airplane. You got to get the folds right, and the nervousness is how far is it going to fly? Um, and you're not quite sure about that, even though you know you're building. You know you got to execute that really well. So, I think it was nervous excitement. You know you've done hopefully, especially if you've done some training sets that you've achieve better than you've ever trained before you know you've had some you, you through your training you know that you're in really good shape i tried to every year do something different so i mean if you do the same thing you'll get the same results you you know that one so i, I always wanted to try and find something now sometimes and not every time did i always go faster and sometimes you try to do something and it it didn't make you quicker but um yeah, i had to try and find something to get me to go quicker so yeah mindset going into a meet was sort of nervous excitement um and really wanting to execute and sometimes i sort of tried to get into the mindset of being like a performer going on stage like i train and practice like they practice their songs all the time or whatever it is and you know their dance routine and now i'm going to show the crowd what all that practice was for, you know, like executing something that they want to see and try and take it into that sort of different sort of mindset for that. When I was younger, I used the ear earphones, got into the music, got, you know, tried to sort of, I suppose, stay in my lane, if you want to sort of give a swimming analogy, yeah. try and stay and not be, not be distracted by what's going out. But then yep. as I got older, I knew how to handle that without having to put earphones in. You know, I could get into my own lane, not worry about what was going on. Even though, you know, I, I didn't have earphones in, I could, I could actually soak it up and still be in my lane. Yeah, yeah. Were you a, a superstitious swimmer? Like, did you get to the pool and always had the same set routine or anything like, you know, you had to do a particular, you know, thing before getting on the blocks, like standing on the left side or anything like that? Uh, not masses. I always had to have a spare pair of goggles in my pocket. Um, that was, um, you know, I, just a fail safe. Uh, but <laughs> I always did the same warm up. I don't know that uh, it, it was just. Yeah, I don't think that would be superstitious, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was just. Easy yeah. to, e easy to just know what <laughs> whatever race I was doing, I didn't have to think about my warm up. Like, yeah, just do it. Yeah, yeah. Five hundred, um, five hundred swim, four hundred reverse medley, three hundred free swim, a two hundred medley, and then a few sprints as the last hundred. Fifteen hundred was my warm up for every race. Like everything I ever did, every world record I broke, every. <laughs> Race record, every, you know, whatever. 
Is that something that you came up with over time or was that something that one particular coach set for you to do and you just, you just said, you know, Oh yeah, no, that was mine. Um, Yeah. I, I, yeah, just, it was something I came up with over time. I don't don't recall really any coach ever. Like I can't remember a coach giving me a warm up to do. I mean, the only other time when I was doing, it wasn't a warm up to do, you know, when you go to a meet and you actually do the training session in the warm up and then you've got to race the rest of the meet. Yeah. yeah. If you want to call that? It, that, that definitely happened. <laughs> right. We're going to just do 5K and then you're going to race six races. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. What's the point of racing? <laughs> um, at any stage, so you won uh, five straight world titles and trying to fly. Was there at any stage where you were just like, there's no way? Like, looking back when you, when you won that fifth title, you look back and you're like, like, how did I do that? Like, got it three, three in a row is unbelievable. And to do another two on top of it is nuts. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know if I ever, at the time, like how life, I look back now and think, I'm proud of myself for having been able to stay in and do it because you know in like 2003 I, I i really i nearly i nearly stopped in 2003 uh and like i suppose they it was the goal was to go well, like i always had certain goals that i was going after you know major meets that i wanted to get to and that became the next thing so I don't think I ever stopped and went, how come I got to five? Because I'd always, that, that, that world championships has always been a goal that I'd reset myself to get to and achieve something at. And because I was like sort of living in the moment then, I, I don't think it was like, in that moment, I don't think I went, how the hell did I get to five? Oh my goodness. Um, I think if anything, because I kind of was I kind of knew that that, that this was going to be like done. So yeah. Um, I kind of think the, uh, the look back on it is like, yeah, super proud. That's all I can say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how often do you swim these days and do you have any goals that you're, that you've set yourself? Um, I swim like three or four times a week. Yeah. Oh, lost you. Yeah. Uh, Hello? Yeah, got you. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> um, I swim three or four times a week now. Um, I don't set goals too much, although I did last year with Suki and um, Ollie Signorini and another friend. We swam Rock Nest Island in a team. Um, so I don't mind a, a few. I want to do a bit more ocean swimming now. Like, don't really want to compare myself. Oh. Keep going because my battery might be quite low. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I don't no, really have too many targets. Um, I just do the ocean swimming. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, is there anything that you look back now on your swimming career and you think... Oh, I should have changed that or I should have done that. Or did you finish your swimming career with absolutely no regrets at all? Yeah, pretty much no regrets. Um, I think, I, I don't think I, I don't think the opportunity was really there to do it in any different way. I put my heart and soul into training. It, it wasn't like really um, like a, like, uh, I didn't really bother training for that or anything. I suppose, yeah, I would say maybe, you know, my my, my biggest sort of, I, I, I was always hoping or wanting to have won an Olympic medal. I didn't quite get there. The best chance to do that was probably Sydney. And we sort of changed the, for the Sydney Olympics, the British team did a, um, uh, uh, changed where the Olympic trials were going to be. And we sort of ended up a bit in no man's land with no 
no ability to do another full training cycle. It wasn't far enough away, but it wasn't close enough to sort of hold a, hold a taper. I, looking mm. back now, I think I probably should have had more confidence that I should have trained through the Olympic trials and aimed more for the Olympics. But I think I didn't want to risk not making the Olympics. So that was probably the, 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 the moment where the chance to sort of win that Olympic medal probably kind of passed me by. And if I look back, maybe, but it's a tough call to, to make. Like, I don't, I don't think anybody mm. around me was even thinking to try to make that call. I, you know, my coach or anybody else wasn't really going, you know what, you should just train through the Olymp Olympic trials. But, you know, it, it's, it's, me and Steve were probably going to make the team whatever. Like, it was going to be the two, me and yep. Stephen Parry. So, ultimately, maybe. But, uh, yeah. Um, no, yeah, I don't it's... really have any regrets at all. I'd say that could have been one thing I might have changed. But I'm not too worried. You know, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty, it was a pretty good career. Got around the world. Would have been nice to have an Olympic medal. I mean, it's not like, I, wherever I go in Australia, like, I'm in a swimming pool with, and someone's got an Olympic medal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you can just whip out. Yeah, you can just yeah, whip out your five gold medals. Like, <laughs> I train, uh, train quite a bit, quite regularly now with Chris Feidler. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, he, he 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 wears it all the time down to the pool, and he's terrible. Honestly, he never takes it off. <laughs> Tell him to put it away. Living yeah, in the past. <laughs> <laughs> um would you give yourself uh any so if you could if you could tell your younger self today any advice about uh your swimming career or just life in general what would it be um i i think the the most important thing i think is what i started the whole of this with and it's enjoy what you do. Like, if you don't enjoy it, don't do it. Really, you know, like, because if you don't enjoy it, when you've got to do a 10K session, like, it's just miserable. And when it's bad, it's miserable. And it's the same in, you know, like, having a job or go look for the stuff in life that you enjoy doing and get good at that. If you get good at what you enjoy doing, and you can get good at it, then it's just absolutely, you know, and I was, I, I say I was lucky, and um, luck comes in different ways, but I think it came because I chose, like I said at the beginning, like it was an accident I chose swimming over gymnastics, and um, I wouldn't have said I was at that point in time a better swimmer than gymnastics. Gymnastics was obviously good to do when I was younger, but I was quite good at that as well. You know, I was flexible and quite strong and, and quite athletic. But yeah, the, 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 the piece, what would I tell myself? Uh, what would I tell myself to, I don't know that I would tell myself too much about that. Cause I, I did, I just got on and enjoyed it. So yeah. that's, that's what I tell anybody really find ways that what I'd say to the viewers, find ways to enjoy it. If you're not, because there is always ways to enjoy stuff. You just got to find them. You got to like tweak it, work with your coach, tweak it to enjoy it. And yeah, you'll get there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that's all we've got uh, for tonight. So yeah, th <laughs> thanks so much for coming on, James, and um, answering all our questions and stuff. It was, it was great to get to know you no a worries. bit more about your swimming thanks, career James. and life. And, yeah. Until next time. <laughs> yeah, good luck to you. And uh, the swimwear shack as well. Yeah, good. yeah. I'll sign my name up on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the beam across there. Oh, yeah, yeah, there. yeah. The world famous post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I feel important because I got my name on there with all the people. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, thank you for the interview. You're doing a good job. Keep going, man. This is a good series. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm getting 
yeah, better with the flow. I was trying to do it in that. I don't know if you noticed, but I was trying to do it a little bit more. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. You know, it's practice. That's what it takes. All right. Uh, see you next time. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, see ya. I think it timed out a little bit then, but anyway, that was great. Um, see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in.